Hi, I'm Derek, and this is DC to Daylight. In the previous episode, we went over some opto-isolator and opto-coupler theory. Well, in this application-based episode, we're going to put them to work as the interface between an Arduino PWM signal and an H-bridge. The H-bridge will allow us to control the speed and direction of a DC brushed motor. Now, driving motors require some special care as they can produce significant voltage transients and noise that could find its way into our sensitive microcontroller circuitry and or power rails disturbing other systems. In order to mitigate that, our friend the optocoupler will provide a means of electrical isolation between the control circuit and the noisy motor circuit. All right, now let's jump right into H-bridges. The optocoupler or optoisolator provides a means of galvanically isolating one circuit from another. That's a fancy way of saying they're not electrically connected. One side of the optocoupler houses an LED, while the other side provides a detector, usually in the form of a phototransistor. When biased properly, when the LED is illuminated, the output transistor turns on, providing a digital signal that is fairly immune to noise and voltage transients. If you're interested in learning more and you missed the previous episode, click the link up above and that'll get you fixed up. The other advantage in using an optocoupler is voltage translation. We can run the LED side from a low voltage supply, say 3.3 or 5 volts, in a typical microcontroller application. On the other side, we can control a high voltage noisy device like a DC motor. The one here operates at around 24 volts DC. Now don't get me wrong, we could drive the base of a BJT or the gate of a FET to control the motor directly, but if there are any intermittent voltage spikes making direct connection to a microcontroller, we could release the magic smoke. The optocoupler pretty much guarantees that we don't do that. An H-bridge is a circuit that allows us to control the direction of a motor by swapping the polarity of the voltage supplied to the motor's terminals. The polarity control is done by turning on or off certain transistors in the circuit, while the speed is controlled by applying a PWM signal to the transistors. It just so happens that the connections and switches form the letter H. Engineers are a creative bunch, aren't they? Here's the real world implementation of that circuit. Let's define the names for these switches. We'll call the high side switches H1 and H2, and we'll call the low side switches L1 and L2. We'll provide power to the top side with a positive voltage and the low side with a negative voltage. Now if I turn on H1 and L2, assuming conventional current flow, I create a path for current from the positive supply through the positive terminal of the motor and out to the negative supply rail. This is clockwise rotation. Now if I turn off H1 and L2 and turn on H2 and L1, I create a path for current from the positive supply through the negative terminal of the motor this time, then out to the negative supply rail. This is counterclockwise rotation. Of course, if I open all switches, the motor is allowed to coast until it eventually stops, you know, due to that pesky friction thing. Now, if the motor were spinning and we suddenly shorted the motor terminals by closing either the high side or the low side switches, the back EMF generated by the motor is forced through the windings, creating torque, which opposes the rotation of the shaft. This is braking. Not a super effective brake, but it is in fact braking it faster than if we just left it coasting. If you have a motor sitting around, short the terminals together and try rotating it and see if you can feel the subtle difference. Now a warning, there are some states that you need to avoid at all cost. Turning on both transistors at the left side of the bridge will cause a direct short across the supply rails, as well as turning on both transistors at the right. All right, so here we can see our truth table. We have H1, H2, which are our high side switches or transistors, L1 and L2, which are the low side switches or transistors. If they're all low, then this is our coasting state. It's like the motor's not connected to anything, right? It's just coasting, freely able to rotate. If we turn on the high side one and low side two, that gives us a clockwise rotation. Flipping all those bits, counterclockwise rotation requires that H2 and L1 be energized. We of course create a braking condition if we set both high side transistors high and low side low, or both low side transistors on and high side transistors off, okay? Now, if we turn on, like we said, H1 and L1, that is a direct short, and if we turn on H2 and L2 at the same time, that is a direct short. Of course, if we turn all of them on, then that is also a direct short, and we want to avoid those conditions at all cost. So we've covered the whole direction thing, but what about controlling the speed? Well, we're gonna to have to advance the circuit a little bit before we do that, and we'll do so on the breadboard. 
Now I've replaced the switches with four transistors. In this application, I'm using both PNP and NPN Darlington types. You could just as easily use field effect transistors or FETs. However, I haven't covered FETs in this series yet, so for now we'll stick with bipolar transistors. Just a side note, Darlington transistors are used in this application as they provide a very large current gain, so we don't need much base current to switch them on and off. They also have a built-in freewheeling diode, so we don't need to place additional diodes in the circuit. If you're new to freewheeling diodes, they're basically there to prevent inductive loads from damaging semiconductor devices when they're switched on and off and producing a high voltage spike. Click the link up above to learn more from our episode on how relays work. There I covered how we're switching inductive loads on and off and how to protect a transistor using a diode, okay? So on all four corners of this circuit, you'll see a 10K resistor. And the purpose of this guy is to ensure that when the transistor is off, it stays off by keeping the base emitter junction reverse biased when the base is de-energized. There's also a 1K resistor going from the optocoupler to the base, and this simply limits the current into and out of the base, depending on what half of the bridge you're looking at. So if we have a plus and minus 9 volt supply, that's 18 volts total, minus 1.4 for the VBE drop, the max current that will flow through the circuit is around 16.6 .6 volts divided by 1 kilo ohm, and that's approximately 17 milliamps, which is well within the range of the PC817's 50 milliamp max collector current. Now we know that we can control the direction by turning on certain transistors, but we can also control their speed by applying that PWM or pulse width modulation signal to the appropriate transistor as well. If we refer back to our truth table, instead of providing static on and off, we can apply a train of pulses whose duty cycle is proportional to the speed. The frequency of the pulses is important, however, that really depends on the motor's mechanical time constant, which depends on the physical construction and electrical characteristics, and the topic really deserves its own thread of conversation. It is, however, a good opportunity to interact with everyone in the community. The link is down in the description, so we'll continue the conversation there. For our demo, we're going to just stick to the Arduino's default value of about 490 hertz. Just realize that for most simple PWM systems, the frequency is held constant and the duty cycle or time versus high versus low is what is changed to vary the speed. Also, don't be surprised that your motor won't start turning until you get anywhere from about 10 to 20% duty cycle, uh, you know, and they have very limited torque at that low end. Anyway, let's put this H-bridge on the breadboard. Here's our board, we've got our Arduino 101 over here. We've got our PWM signals that are coming from uh, pins three, five, six, and nine. We've got ground. Those are only connected to these resistors here, which are the front end of those optocouplers, okay? Other than that, it's all isolated from this higher voltage supply here. Electrically, this is galvanically isolated from the motor circuit, okay? We've got our motor connected here. We've got our four transistors, PNP, NPN, okay, and the optocouplers are connected to the basis of those through these resistors. I've got our scope probes connected so we can see the pulse width modulation changes on both sides of the bridge. All right, so now we're gonna have to write some Arduino software to control uh, the spinning of this motor. We've got a velocity profile here that we're gonna follow. So we're gonna uh, define time on the x-axis and we're gonna have velocity along the y-axis. We're gonna ramp up this positive slope until we hit this dwell time. And we'll set that to two seconds just to keep it high. And after that two seconds, we will ramp down uh, to zero for our velocity. You can see the digital signals here for the PWN. We are going to use the analog write function of the Arduino to set this value from starting from zero up to 255. We'll hold for two seconds and then we'll ramp 255 back down to zero. Now that will be for the forward or clockwise direction. And then we'll have to switch direction and repeat that process to go back to where we were. So let's take a look at that. First, let's define some constants. All right, so first things first here, we need to define uh, the directions, okay? Forward and reverse, zero and one. Then we have to tell the Arduino what pins we wanna use for the pulse width modulated signals for uh, H1, which is transistor one high, transistor two high, transistor one low, transistor two low. Uh, PWM pins three, five, six, and nine on this particular Arduino. Always check the data sheet because they're all different. Then we have to define the dwell time, the amount of time we want to stay high, right, at maximum speed, and that's two seconds or 2,000 milliseconds. And uh, then we have a PWM step time. We can't ramp up super fast because the motor uh, won't be able to get up to speed that quickly, so we need to define some delay between each PWM step time, which is 10 milliseconds. Uh, PWM max val we have to define for eight bits, right? We're starting at zero, 
and we're changing the pulse width modulation up to 255, which is the maximum value. Zero indexed to zero to 255. Then we have to provide a variable for the direction itself that we're gonna manipulate. So we set up an integer, the name is direction, and it defaults to forward. Now we need to create a motion function that will take the direction and PWM value as parameters. All right, so here's our motion function. Like I said, we're taking the direction and the PWM value, zero to 255 as an argument. All right, so if our direction is forward, we want to set uh, the PWM value to transistor high one on the left side and low two on the right side, okay? The PWM values, uh, the other transistors will be zero. If the direction is reverse, then the opposite is true, okay? H2 and L1 get the PWM signal and the other two are zero. Now we need to write the main part of our program here. So on the Arduino, we always have a void loop. We always have a void setup, right? And here, if we're gonna do any debugging, we'll just say serial begin, uh, 9600 standard fare for the Arduino. Now in the loop, that's where the magic happens. All right, so let's take a look at what we did here. So we set up in our main loop, we want to ramp up the profile. So we start at PWM value of zero, and then we increment until we get less than or equal to 255, right? Because we're incrementing here. All right, so we set the direction, which the default was forward, and the PWM value is whatever this incremented value uh, becomes uh, from zero to 255. In between, we delay for our PWM step time so we don't increment too fast, that way the motor can keep up. So then we're gonna dwell for those 2000 milliseconds, right, at the top. Then we will ramp down that profile starting at 255 and we are going to decrement until we get down to zero, all right? So inside of that loop, we do the same thing. We set the direction with that PWM value from our loop and we delay for that PWM step time. And at the very end, this is the trick, we're gonna keep looping through this but every time we iterate through that uh, motion profile, at the end, we're gonna swap the direction. This is a quick way to, to flip the bit from a zero to a one. So at the end of every loop, the direction flips from forward to reverse, forward to reverse, okay? So now we'll put this in the uh, Arduino IDE, program it, and we'll test it out. All right, let's reset our Arduino and see. Okay, there we go. The top trace is the top side transistors. So we're going forward, decreasing, Okay, and then we reverse directions, increasing speed, plateau, and we're decreasing. So that's coming from the Arduino and driving the optocoupler. So let's turn on the power to the motor side. Looks like it's working. Well, that's about it for our friend, the H-Bridge. Uh, this video is starting to get a bit long, so I didn't get a chance to touch on some of the finer details of H-Bridge stuff like sign magnitude driving, meaning do we switch both transistors high and low at the same time, or do we leave one on while pulsing the other? Um, and when braking, do we need uh, to add a resistor in series with the motor to help dissipate back EMF? I also didn't get to touch on things like the thermodynamics of the transistors uh, when you need a heat sink or frequency versus torque curve. So anyway, there's more to be uh, discovered there. Um, there's only so much time we have, but that being said, this is another great opportunity to move over to the community down in the links below or contact me in the comments. Okay, so this gives us a chance to open a discussion about the subject and an opportunity to learn from each other as a group and for me to learn from you. Anyway, thanks for watching. That's it for me. I'll see you next time. Have a good one.